Hello, 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 everybody. It's your boy, JMOLS of JMOLS Gaming. Here today, combat is composed of using these abilities called arts. And these arts have various effects, ranging from damage to healing to various support based buffs and debuffs. Some arts have special parameters that you can meet to gain additional effects or damage. For instance, Shulk has two damage dealing abilities, or primarily damage dealing abilities. Backslash does more damage if you attack from behind an enemy, and Slit Edge applies a physical damage debuff on the enemy. So when you hit that enemy with physical attacks, you'll deal even more damage. Ideally, you would use something like that before your other arts so that they get that benefit from it. Each character kind of has a role. Ryan and Dunban are tanks, Shulk is a damage dealing support, Shala is a healing based support, and Melia is a jack of all trades. She can really do good damage, she has great support capabilities, she can heal a bit, she can even tank a bit if you build her so. She has melee attacks, she can kind of do everything, and that is one of the reasons that she is my personal favorite to play as. But we'll get to her. So while you are in combat, you have an overall combo you want to try and do as much as possible. Break into topple into daze. And what this does is stun the enemy, preventing them from hitting you. Break itself doesn't do anything, but what it does do is let you apply topple with various characters to actually stun the enemy. You can kind of get around using break with Melia, but she's the exception. And if you apply daze, then the mob you're fighting will be stunned for the entire daze duration. And then after daze wears off, it'll still be stunned for the entire topple duration, back to back. So you can get a good 5 to 7 seconds of the enemy being chain stunned using this combo. And it's really effective, especially when you are taking a lot of damage and just need some time to get your bearings and heal up a bit. Outside of this, you personally control one character at any given time. So you can't swap characters in combat, you can only swap out of combat. Some characters are better with AI controlling them than others. Shulk is one of them, funnily enough, since even though he's the protagonist. When the AI controls him, you don't need to worry about his Monado cooldown, since whenever you need a Monado art, you can just approach him and he'll do it with a button prompt. Just remove that one art that he has, that halves his health to fill the talent gauge, when the AI is controlling him, you really don't need his HP bar yo-yoing cause the AI spams it, thinking it is impressing you by using its abilities when they come off a cooldown, like a cat bringing a dead bird to you, in bed gifting you the spoils of war, you just don't need that energy. There is one character I want to talk about, and talk about how they play, because the game does a frankly crap job at explaining how to play as Melia. And like I said before, she's my favorite to play as. So Melia is a spell caster predominantly. You can build her to be melee if you want, but I imagine most of you out there will be using her as a spell caster. A lot of her arts are summon X element arts, where you cast the art and an elemental orb will spawn and float around your head. She can have three of these at any given time. We will call this act of putting elements up on Melia stockpiling. When an enemy, sorry, when an element is stockpiled on Melia, she emits a buff to the rest of the party that's close enough to her so long as the element is stockpiled on her. So if you find yourself out of range and your party aren't getting buffed, just run towards them or run towards your party if you are controlling her. Different elements give you different buffs if they are stockpiled. Fire gives the party a strength buff. Wind gives an agility buff. Lightning gives an ether buff, etc, etc. So if you're using a party consisting of Melia, Shulk, and Ryan, a lot of your damage from Shulk and Ryan will be physical, so buffing their strength by stockpiling two fire orbs on Melia is really good because they'll do more damage. Or maybe you are using Dunban who is based on agility and dodging enemy attacks. Maybe one of the elements you stockpile is wind for the agility buffs and a fire one for a strength buff, since you can mix and match. But remember, when you discharge an element on Melia, when you cast one to the enemy and do damage with it, called discharging an element, it will use up the orb that you just summoned. So, say I cast fire, then wind, then lightning in that order, and then I use the discharge ability. It will shoot out the lightning orb while I keep the fire and wind ones. And if I use it again, 
without, you know, stockpiling another element, it'll cast the wind and then fire. So the way that I play Melia is to keep two elements stockpiled at all times, while using that third orb slot for offense to discharge. So I shoot out those lightning abilities, or I can stockpile a third fire or wind one and use that one to, to cast on the enemy. There are so many situations where you can mix and match what elements you are using or have stockpiled to benefit the party, and I love that decision making. It's why I find her so much fun to play as. Now, why do I control her and not the AI? Because I don't trust the AI to stockpile elements, let alone stockpile the ones I want at any given time. I just find it smoother to control them and more direct control. But that's the thing with Xenoblade 1. You can just do whatever the hell you want. Each character is so customizable and has such varying playstyles, you can really do whatever you want and beat the game. You can augment a lot of the characters' playstyles with what gems you slot into their gear. I personally like buffing lightning damage on Melia, so her lightning attack does big numbers, while I give Shulk the ability to double hit each auto attack while giving him haste so his auto attacks are quicker. Pair the gem system with the Talon trays, well they're more like branches to be fair, where you pick a path and progressive and passively stockpile SP I think it's called, to unlock more passes for these characters. These can be build defining, depending upon which branch you go down, and you can unlock additional branches with various side quests. And then on top of that, you can take talents from other characters if you have enough affinity between those two characters, and with that, you can really do some stupid crap with the builds in this game. It's honestly hilarious. Like, one of them, like a personal favorite of mine, is a build with Dunban. Wait, he has a build, right? Where you stack agility and a talent that gives him a ton of agility if he isn't wearing any armor. So Naked Dunban is a legit build you can do in this game. And he'll just dodge pretty much every attack that's thrown at him. One of my favorite builds is on the last character that you unlock, where you can make it so their auto attacks have a high chance of crit. And then borrow some talents from Dunban to make it so critical hits heal you. So you can have them auto attacking with double attack gems, auto attack more often with a haste gem or two, then you're auto attacking very quickly. More often than not, those auto attacks attack twice because of the double gems, double attack gems. And with the towns, you can make it so each of those individual attacks has a chance to crit. And when they crit, they heal you. So they are just constantly healing themselves and it's pretty funny to turn them into a tank this way. When you watch them get hit by a massive ability and just watch their health bar just go back up to full. It's hilarious. You can do absolutely wacky builds like that on pretty much every character. You just gotta go look through each character's talent trace, mix and match, build affinity with them, and get the gems you want and need. No shame in looking up a build, by the way. I did that. Just beware of spoilers for who the final party member is. And you can find some really super interesting builds that you might want to try. That's how I learned about those last two builds I just talked to you about. And I'm by no means a min-maxing expert when it comes to Xenoblade 1, but learning how to play this game can be very rewarding and enjoyable, just because of how customizable each character is. They complement each other. One character's weaknesses might be another character's strengths, so you might build them accordingly. You mix and match various characters with different builds to do wild things. And honestly, it's just a very enjoyable gameplay loop where I'm focusing on combat just as much out of it than I am in it. And I haven't even touched on every aspect of the combat, like art canceling or chain attacks, but the game does a decent enough job of explaining those ideas, so just go in and be willing to experiment and try new things and give the other party members a chance. They all feel and play different and have different paces to them. So if someone is too fast or too slow for you, probably just try a different build or just try someone else until you find a style that suits you. And go, and go have some fun and enjoy some Xenoblade. I'm going to call the video there for the day. Thank you all for tuning in. Hope this video helped you out. If it did, please leave a comment down below. And if you want me to talk about any other aspect of Xenoblade's gameplay or Xenoblade in general, just leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your recommendations. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and your opinions. And while you're down there, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out and helps support future content. And I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe out there, everybody. Have a great day. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody.